the inimitable, inestimable, and awesomeable Carla Garrett. Thanks so much, Mickey, and thank you to everyone who's been volunteering this weekend. You know, we are a volunteer-driven organization, so let's give a shout-out to all the hard workers. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us today for this conversation about independence. I think that, you know, the time is high for us to start to have this talk, and that really is what we're doing. We're just opening a dialogue where people generally who believe in persuasion, we think the best ideas can win. And so we just want to talk about this idea and, you know, explore whether this is feasible, what it would look like, how it would work. I'm very, very delighted to welcome uh, our panelists here today. Uh, on the far end, we have Elliot Alu Axelman. Woo! <laughs> is a critical care and flight certified paramedic, an EMS instructor, field training officer, and has been working on an ambulance and 911 and interfacility systems since 2011. He is the founder, owner, and editor-in-chief of libertyblock.com. Alu published three books in 2021. Three, that's what you get when you lock us down. You give us a lot of time to do stuff. Uh, his books are The Blueprint for Liberty, Corona Fascism, and The Progressive Solution. Alu writes for the Defiance Press and Publishing and is working on his fourth book, of course he is. He firmly <laughs> believes that the most important issue for those who believe in liberty is state independence from the union. In the middle, I have a very short bio, I'm afraid to say, for Rabbi Steve Axelman. He is the vice president of CalExit, which of course is the independence movement out in California. And he is the founder of... Americans United for Peaceful Separation. There we go. Thank you, Steve. And then uh, we are delighted to welcome to the free state of New Hampshire, our brother, from Texas, uh, that is Daniel Miller. Yeehaw. He, he, huh? I said yeehaw. Yeah, yeehaw. <laughs> He's a sixth generation Texan, a technology consultant, best selling author, and president of the Texas Nationalist Movement, and your Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor, which I assume is old now, or no. Are no, you running? You're not, running. Not anymore. All right. <laughs> but why do you want to bring up a sore subject? Oh, sorry about that, honey. <laughs> And he's an outspoken advocate for Texas independence since 1996. Daniel is considered to be the founder of the modern day Texas movement. Um, we're hoping Mike Sylvia will still make it here today. He is the sponsor of CACR 32, which is the bill that we just introduced uh, in New Hampshire this session. So we are you know, going apace at this. I thought I would play my testimony just by way of introduction for people who may not know me. It's about four minutes long. And this was what I testified to up at the State House maybe a month ago now. Um, and so for those who may not be familiar, CACR 32 is a New Hampshire constitutional amendment uh, that basically is, it's like four lines long. It says, and how it works in New Hampshire is a constitutional amendment has to pass the House by, I believe it's 66%, and then it has to pass the general populace by 60%. So it's a pretty high threshold. We have in the past passed constitutional amendments in New Hampshire. In fact, in 2018, we were successful in putting a very stringent privacy uh, clause onto the New Hampshire Constitution that I would love to see more uh, action on as we head into this bio-fascism uh, phase of uh, the decline of the American Empire. So CACR 32 just says that New Hampshire peacefully declares independence and proceeds as a sovereign nation. This is my testimony. Uh, it's four minutes when I practiced it, but he had 27 minutes, so we want to look at it. We legislated that I asked to research the bill and uh, to be able to, that's why we have no front. Oh, that was past the second, let's do that. I always have reason for my method. Uh, honorable committee members, thank you for your time today. My name is Carla Garrett, but my friends call me Queen Quill. 
So I guess if we're going to have a monarchy, monarch wolf, uh, you know, I'm gay. I'm an immigrant to America and became a U.S. citizen in 2000, having to take a citizen's test where, you know, new Americans learn about the Constitution and the enumerated things that the federal government is supposed to be limited to doing, which isn't much. I'm an author, I'm an activist, and I'm an attorney. But I'm also a political refugee to New Hampshire, moving here in 2008 as part of the Free State Project. I was the Republican nominee for New Hampshire Senate in District 20, and I received 45% of the vote in the last election. I'm not going to run again. I'm a proud free stater, and like many, but not all free staters, I support New Hampshire independence. I'm testifying today in support of CACR 32, because it should always be in the hands of the people how they are governed. The federal government has failed us. It no longer follows the Constitution. The federal government ushers in unconstitutional wars. The federal government hurts our fellow Granite Staters with its war on drugs, which just makes bad personal decisions worse. The federal government colluding with the Federal Reserve makes us all poorer due to the inflation caused by money printing. Face it, Granite Staters are abused by DC. What do we advise victims to do when they're abused? We tell them to leave, which means we have the right to ask for a divorce. That's all today's proposed amendment is. An opportunity, a democratic opportunity, for granite staters to decide whether our relationship with the federal government is worth salvaging. I say it's not, and everyone should know we would all be better off if we went our separate ways. What are we taught about abusers? They will tell you, you can never leave. They will tell you they will change. They might even tell you it's your fault. Abusers and the federal government are gaslighting liars who cannot be trusted. We all know the definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over. And it's your duty to at least create the opportunity for granite staters to decide their own destinies. As an, as an independent nation, New Hampshire would be prosperous and peaceful along the lines of a small, successful country like Liechtenstein or Luxembourg or Switzerland. We'd have four, si four times the size of Iceland's population. We'd easily be able to work with our neighbors, much like the countries in the Shenzhen area in Europe do. Many American retirees already receive their Social Security pensions in foreign countries like Mexico. No future challenge related to independence is insurmountable. Where there's a will, there's a way. Let's see if there's a will. There are many compelling reasons to support national divorce. And I encourage folks who are curious to visit the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence website. I serve on this federally recognized 501c3 educational nonprofits board. And at nhindependence.org, you'll find hundreds of reasons why you should support a free and independent New Hampshire, not least of which would be that we would all be richer if we could keep our hard-earned federal income taxes. And that's about $25,000 on average for grand estators. So if you just want to be a little richer, you know, ask your representatives to support this. Today, your only duty is to, the democ is to democracy which every single one of you claim to support, you need to vote in favor of this opportunity because it's not up to you. It's up to individual granite staters. We're called the live free or die state. When we become independent, we'll also be the live free and thrive state. Afford us the opportunity to try. I want to just address briefly a couple of things that came up here today. Um, in 2016, when Brexit happened, uh, there were several online polls that were done. 42% of Granite Staters in two separate polls, including one done by the union leader, supported a free and independent New Hampshire, 42%. We've come a long way since then. Uh, to the point that Representative Edwards made, 
uh, you know, he said he's going to vote against it. I think that we should say, let's see what the people think. That is truly what the role should be here, is let's leave it open to the people. To uh, Representative uh, Brody Deshay, um, you know, it's disappointing that you would try and sort of lean into the gaslighting and create this sense of fear where it's like rebellion, treason, you know, all these yeah. things. The right yeah, this is horrible. He voted to against the right to work. She needs to go. And, um, and so these are just scare tactics. Uh, I believe it was you that said the power resides in the people. So I would say let's prove it. Let's let them vote. And then I will leave you with this, especially for my Democratic friends. If you've tweeted or mentioned the words voter rights or democracy in the past five years, I suggest you also support this. <laughs> Very good. So there you have it. This is the number one reason why everyone who doesn't live here yet should move here because you get to do stuff like that if you're willing to do it. Um, and again, you know, we're just opening the dialogue. But I want to have these fine folks talk a little bit about what maybe your visions are. So I had a good five minutes there to sort of lay it out for myself. Um, we are going to suggest that, I, it seems to me like because this is a conversation and because we're really sort of trying to figure out what this would look like and genuinely because Granite Staters, everyone's got questions, right? Like what, once you get over the, the, the notion in your brain where you're like, you want to what? And then you go, oh, well, how would that work? So we will definitely be taking a good part for Q&A, but maybe uh, starting with Daniel, Maybe tell us a little bit about like where the Texas movement currently is, and and um, maybe how we could work together or how, uh, collab collaborate. Yeah, thanks, Carla. Howdy. Howdy. Oh, that won't do at all. Let's try that again. Howdy. 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 There we go. Thank you very much. See, now it feels like I'm in a hometown crowd. This is nice. <laughs> well, look, uh, I, I want to just start off by, by saying this to, to answer your question. Um, you know, I'm here with you today. Uh, at this panel uh, on 100, the 186th anniversary of the fall of the Alamo. And, uh, you know, I, while Pee Wee Herman may remember the Alamo a little bit cliche, I understand for, for Texans and really for all lovers of independence, it should hold a special place. Uh, because there will be people that will tell you that the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo was about many things, but I will tell you from the words of Colonel Travis himself, who, who said this, he said that, let the convention therefore go on and make a declaration of independence, and then the world will know and my men will know what we are fighting for. For if a, a declaration is not made, then my men are willing to lay down their arms and surrender. But under the flag of independence, we are willing to peril our lives a thousand times. You see, independence is worth fighting for. Yes. And whether that's independence in Texas, or whether that's independence in New Hampshire, or frankly, any place in the world, the right of self-government and self-determination is absolutely worth fighting and dying for, but it's also worth living for. And so it's one of the reasons that I'm here today with you to shake the hands of the state representatives here who had the intestinal fortitude <laughs> and the backbone to support letting the people of New Hampshire vote on their independence. time we had this little uh, party together was at Pork Fest. Was that Pork Fest 2020 or 21? 20, 20, right? 21, okay, the last one. Um, and that was just also spectacular because, you know, in some ways, and, and maybe uh, Steve, I'll let you talk about this with Cal Exit. Part of the interesting thing that's happening is what people do is they want to marginalize groups against each other. So people want to say either that the independence movement or the secessionist movement is alt-right. But then you look at California and you're like, but that's extremely leftist. And then you look at sort of Texas and maybe that's more conservatarian and our flavor is a little more libertarian up here. And so I think the compelling or interesting thing is that this isn't it is not a political left-right paradigm as they try to force us into. This is a very much an us-them paradigm where it's like, but wait a second, you are saying you, you have the consent of the governed. Well, you know, 
well, you know, we hate it, but let's say we're the governed in that sort of scenario, then let's talk about consent, right? So Steve, CalExit, what's happening? What's happening with CalExit? Well, what's a nice Jewish boy from New York like me doing as <laughs> vice president of CalExit? Well, I've been involved in CalExit for, I guess, about two years right now. And um, the reason I'm involved is because I support their right to self-determination and because I don't agree with them on almost anything. <laughs> and one of the beautiful things about CalExit is Marcus Ruiz Evans, who's their president or CEO, had reached out to Liberty Block and my son here several years ago, saying he doesn't think conservatives in this country will let California go. And we let him know exactly what this gentleman just said with his expression. Most of us would be happy to leave our homes at 5 in the morning and push them into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and he was very surprised at that. And I've been working very well along with them. And they, what's nice about it is when I agree with them, it's great. And when I vehemently disagree with them, it's still great. Because that's why we want to have a peaceful separation. We can live together as friends if we don't have to control each other's lives. Yeah. Some of you may have noticed CalExit has gone through some uh, tumult in the last few months. We are building it back. They have, I believe, about 130,000 people on their email list. And it's slightly quieter now because we probably think there's a left-wing or fascist administration now in Washington. Believe it or not, people in CalExit think that this administration is far to the right of Trump. So be that as it may, I see a lot of eyebrows going up, but that is why we all want to help them realize their self-determination and become an independent uh, nation unto their own. I just want to mention one of the things that I want to do most, and I'm proud to be working with Daniel Miller and of course my son from FNHI, is to bring the movements together, help them work with each other, like Carla said very well, it's not conservatives, it's not libertarians, it's not, um, what was the third one? Liberals. Right, it's all of them. So none of us can be considered nuts. I know that one of the uh, comments during the hearing at which Carlo appeared, somebody said we're just a bunch of, um, what are we, we're wackos, we're um, laughing stocks. We're laughing stocks. Well, I don't think that that representative, no, you're not laughing stocks. You're vanguard, you're way ahead of it because there are several movements like this in the country. I don't think of myself as a radical. I definitely don't think of myself as KKK or Nazi. Yet I do know that many people out there, including a book I just listened to this morning on the way up from New York called The Next Civil War, is trying to paint those of us who believe in self-determination as just that, radical, yep. militia, yep. Nazis. We are not, and I hope to always be a face for the movement to convince people we're just a bunch of normal people who want to live our own lives, go our own way, and when we're all done, I welcome questions. Great, thank you. And I love how you emphasize the word peaceful there. You know, that is something I think that when we think about the messaging of this issue, we really should lead first. You know, when, you, when you're doing sales, you're always like thinking about how you persuade people and and there's this constant notion that self-determination or trying to get from here to there must be violent but I think we askew and we really want to do this peacefully I think the point is very much with this bill and maybe uh, Elliot you can talk to this a little bit right is the people in the room who are there testifying we're there because we want to start that conversation I'm sure you have some thoughts about that yeah thank you for 245 years, all of us in this room and our ancestors, so my father, my father's father, and people who lived here before us, have been trying a certain tactic, pretty much one tactic or a few tactics to get more freedom. Everyone here at Liberty Forum wants more freedom than we currently have. Throughout New Hampshire, maybe 50, 70, 80, 90% want more freedom than we currently have. We'd like to see taxes lower or totally gone. We'd like to see the elimination of most or all restrictions by the government and maybe full voluntarism and full freedom. We've been trying certain tactics, the primary one being voting. We've all heard every two years, every four years, just vote harder, vote for someone better. At that hearing, I think Carla mentioned, Representative Jess Edwards, who is pro-liberty and we all like, he spoke against this, this CACR at that hearing. He's a state rep, and he said, well, if you want to change it, just vote for someone better for Congress or run for office yourself. 
And again, what I wanted to say, and I think I mentioned to him after, the, after that hearing, is we've been trying that every day for 245 years. And as, as a few others have mentioned, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing every day for 245 years and expecting a different result all of a sudden out of the blue for no reason. We've been trying voting. We've also been trying certain lawsuits, you know, certain groups think that if we sue and go to the Supreme Court and spend 10 years and $87 million, maybe they'll give us a tiny bit of breathing, breathing room to carry 10 rounds instead of nine rounds in our guns. No thanks. <laughs> lawsuits don't really work. I've written a few articles and I've written in my books. Even when a lawsuit does work, it really doesn't work. Even when the Supreme Court rules and DC versus Heller, which wasn't a great case, that we have an individual right to bear arms, states like New York and California and even other states and even the federal government via the ATF or regulations, rulemaking, even Trump did that, they can still ban guns. So court cases, even when we win, we still lose. So we've been trying court cases, we've been trying voting, we've been trying petitions, we've tried to call our representatives. I've tried to speak, I went to uh, Congressman Pappas's office in Manchester. I spoke to a staffer who was very nice. He didn't really care what I have to say about freedom though. They're never gonna support freedom. We've tried all these tactics. There's only one more thing we can try that's peaceful and we all wanna keep it peaceful. The only other thing we can do is leave. If you've tried to get your abuser to stop abusing you in every single way by appealing to his sense of morality and logic and all that, and they don't listen, there's only one thing you can do to defend yourself from actual abuse, short of violence, and that is leaving. And like we mentioned, a few others have mentioned, we tell people being abused to leave. Uh, as far as this bill, it, it's a CACR 32, the committee due to threats of being called traitors and treason, all 21 members of the committee on the House uh, State Federal Relations Committee recommended against it, 21 nothing, recommended to the House to kill it. Um, it will still have a roll call in the full House March 10th, and if they don't get to it on the 10th, it'll be on the 15th or 16th. So that's, that's the latest I'm hearing from the state reps. Over the next five, six days, everyone here should be calling their state reps. If everyone here calls and emails their state reps endlessly, we might get 50, 80, 100 votes in the House and maybe even more, who knows. So that, that's the important thing, and I'm happy to take Q&A at the end, thank you. Great, and uh, so uh, one of the discussions I've heard with regard to the CA CR 32 is that it provides the opportunity to sort of move the Overton window a little bit, right? So instead of, you know, doing the court case where you're waiting forever, part of this could also tactically maybe make the path for more nullification open, right? So if people are going, well, secession, that sounds crazy, but okay, maybe we could give them this or this so that they're conceding something. So I think there is a tactical uh, uh, component to it, regardless of how successful this is going to be. Um, I believe there's seven or eight sponsors on that bill. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that floor vote. I, um, so I want to maybe caution people, I'm not quite as optimistic as Elliot. I'm hoping we could get that many, but it is going to really depend on folks like you. We're going to start taking questions fairly soon, just because Mickey walked out to throw his stuff away. Um, so if you are planning to ask questions, maybe start lining up so long. But while they're doing that, can we maybe do just like briefly, I would love to hear the number one criticism or counter argument you hear and how you like to counter that like what's your favorite argument that's like a short question and how you go well here's how we could do like obviously mine is sort of like well we'd all be a little richer right money talks but i'm curious financial energy social whatever look here's here's the bottom line uh, you know i've been at this for 25 years and you get pounded with every criticism, every question, like what's going to happen to my favorite major league sports team. So I, I'm just going to I'm going to make a confession to you: is I got tired of answering all those little minutia questions uh, a long time ago. So what I started doing was this: I started asking people, say, look, let, why don't you answer my question? If Texas was currently a self-governing, independent nation among nations. We had control over our own immigration and border <coughs> policy. We had our own monetary system, our own military, our own foreign policy, our own embassy, our passports. We were had our own dadgum Olympic team, right? We were a self-governing independent nation in every respect. And instead of talking about Texas, we were talking about whether or not Texas should join the union. Knowing everything you know about the federal government right now, would you vote to join the union? And if the answer is no, if you would not vote to join, then why in the hell would you ever vote to stay? And, and you would be surprised. I mean, it, it, that right there, that turn has helped us get to the point where 
we know for certain if we have the Texas vote tomorrow, we win. And we don't win by a razor thin margin, we win by a lot. Which is one of the reasons that the establishment guys fight so hard to give the people the vote on this issue because they know we're going to take them to the polls and we're going to spank them because they have no argument as to why we should stay in the union or frankly any state for that matter. Wow. That's great. I love that. That is fantastic, right? Because you basically put the onus on them. You're like, the, who would defend anything the federal government's it's, doing? It's, it's about time they answer some questions, right? You know, they, they, <laughs> they want to dismiss our ideas off of some minutia like, well, you know, may, you know, how, uh, is our major league sports team going to be in the national league? You know, wh whatever. It's just always something ridiculous, right? They want to flunk the idea overall over some minutia, and it's really time that they answer the questions. Let those guys make the case for why the union is so great. Yeah. And 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 watch those guys squirm. Yeah. Woo. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I love the question people say. New Hampshire's a small state. We all know. It's no secret. Texas on the map does look bigger than New Hampshire by a little bit. <laughs> so New Hampshire is, is one of the smaller joke? states. <laughs> okay, New Hampshire's a small state, one of the smallest by geography and by population. We have 1.4 million people. And people yeah, say without the great, benevolent, amazing, brilliant dictators in D.C. like Biden, Pelosi, Clinton, uh, Schumer, those amazing people, we would all starve to death and be poor and die because we're all stupid and we don't know how to work and we're all poor and we would starve to death. So when people ask me that and they say, how would our economy survive? This is one of the most common, maybe the most common, that's why I want to talk to it. Maybe the most common thing I hear. That and the military issue, which I could address as well. If we left, if we were independent, we would not even be one of the 20 smallest countries in the world. And those countries, you know, maybe uh, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, um, uh, Andorra, a bunch of other very small countries are doing just fine. In fact, a lot of them, as I think Stephen Villiers, I think did a video explaining it, some of those smallest countries have the highest median uh, income in the world, like the highest in the world. I think um, Andorra, maybe Luxembourg, and a few others are the richest in the world per capita. But we would not be the smallest. We would be you know, in the middle or maybe towards the, the smaller side, but that's fine. Overall, economically, as we all know here, we have the highest median household income in the Union, New Hampshire. We have the best unemployment, best economy, best economic freedom, I believe, number one, rated by a few places now, Cato and Fraser Institute. And we have overall the best economy and the lowest or near the lowest overall total tax burden. So we would do phenomenally well. The two big reasons I think economically we wouldn't do, we wouldn't survive, we would thrive, like Carla loves to say. Our economy would boom to, I believe, again, people get upset at me for making uh, rosy predictions and they, they call me an optimist, which is crazy if you know me. <laughs> I say we would be part, probably the most prosperous nation in history of existence by a billion fold, like more than Hong Kong and Japan multiplied by a billion. Here's why. The two big reasons. We would all save thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, each of us, on federal taxes. My federal, inc my federal tax burden is thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, and I have an average income. We'd all save thirty to fifty grand a year just on taxes. What that does for reinvestment and everything else, and if I save thirty grand, maybe I can open that gym I've wanted to open for a decade. Then I can invest more in the community, and it grows from there. But even even forget taxes. The biggest reason I think we boom is regulations. Just federal regulations, and and we could talk about federal um, regulatory capture and all that stuff later. The the Regulations from the federal government in 2014 in a study. In 2013, the year, regulations from the federal government cost the United States economy over $2 trillion, meaning now it's probably three or five or $10 trillion. Trillions. Divide that out, and it's, for New Hampshire, it's over $10 billion. So just the regulations, and what I mean by that is every business, if I want to start a gym, I probably have to hire 17 lawyers, 85 OSHA compliance officers, and 50 other regulatory experts to, hire, to start a gym to make sure I comply with federal law so I don't go to jail, like some other gym owners recently. So just Please that cost to me. Yeah, just that cost to me and saving on the regulations would save us billions. And I think with no federal regulations, we would boom. It's the most prosperous economy in history of existence. So the economy issue, I think, is solved there. Right. Very good. Wonderful. So we have about 20 minutes left. Do you want to add something and then we'll start taking questions? I want to take over the Q&A. I have two have questions. I'll be very, very quick. Please raise your hand if you support peaceful separation from the union. Woo! Okay, now put your hands down. And please raise your hand if you believe that you have a right to separate no matter what they tell you the law is. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Questions. That is a, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, just by way of background, because you couldn't see it there, the, the, uh, in the video right after that, Al Baldessaro, the head of the committee, said, oh, well, who here is free staters? And probably about 95% of the room raised their hands. And I think that was a bit of a turning point where he was like, oh, but he doesn't understand that we have become such a force in the state 
that there are local Granite Staters who now self-identify as Free Staters. And we welcome you to the fold. If you believe you know, in personal responsibility and personal independence and live free or die so that we can thrive, you know, come to the club. And so I actually followed up with Al and I let him know, I was like, don't think that means we're just the refugees. Half of that room where people I know were born and raised in New Hampshire, so. All right, Pam. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let my pessimism come out here. Um, I've done a lot of things that Elliot spoke about. I've voted, I've run for office numerous times. I can't even get some people to believe that income tax is wrong or that a lot of the things the federal government does is wrong. How the blazes are we going to get people to understand that we can just leave? What are some tactics that you think might work if we can't even get someone like Al, who's great, and Jesse Edwards to yeah, understand? Realistically, it's a good question. Realistically, we're not going to get 100%. No one's ever going to get 100% of anything. Some people um, are going to be against us no matter what. Some are with us no matter what. Some are on the fence. We should most, in general, be speaking to those who are on the fence. Anyone who supports liberty, and that's why I, I wrote my first book, The Blueprint for Liberty. It's targeted towards conservatives, libertarians, voluntarists, although voluntarists already probably support secession, uh, independence. Anyone who believes in freedom, if you believe we should have more freedom than we have now, like, you know, maybe lower taxes or no taxes at all, or if you believe in any, even conservatism or freedom or even moderate Republican, once you read that book, I haven't had a single person read it and not support independence afterwards, because it, it explains why we should give up. I know a lot of people, tons of my friends, still think they could save the United States. If we elect Trump again, he didn't last time, but if we elect him again after, you know, in 2024, then he'll save America. And they've been saying this every day for 245 years. And, you know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me, fool on you, fool me twice, you know, how Joe Biden, you know the thing. That's the whole Texas thing. Yeah, you know the thing. I know, but he so, said it like President P. Pants. <laughs> yeah, so, so... We've been trying voting. We've tried all these tactics, and that's why I say the book and in so many articles. We've tried it their way, and there's no state in the United States. It's not even saying stagnant. Everything is getting worse. Almost every single thing in, in the states and federally, the, the gun laws, the taxes, regulations, and the wars in every country in the world, and the, obviously the Federal Reserve mo monetary policy, almost everything is getting a lot worse every day. So once they realize this, I think they'll start supporting independence. And uh, just to add to that, I do think that COVID really di was a gift in some ways as well. I mean, it was, you know, it was a lot of hell, but total the biofascist totalitarianism is a growth industry for us. And I think a lot of those on the fence people started to wake up in a new way. Look, we made a lot of Karens, but I think we shook a few of them out too, so. So... <clears throat> Um, this is more just a, a question of implementation rather than of end goal, but what do you think about the idea of uh, moving into a territory like Puerto Rico as an intermediate step? Uh, this would allow you to remove federal income tax and also be much more understandable yeah. to the majority of Daniel, people. Daniel, unless you guys want to know about this. I, I was asked this a few days, a few yeah, weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, my wife's not in the room, right? So, so <laughs> we were discussing this in the lead up to the bill with Mike Sylvia and the reps we were discussing, should it be to be a territory full on independence and all that. What I said is, so right now independence is kind of halfway between statehood and not being in the union at all. Um, and pretty much what, what I think would happen is, if you were to ask your wife if you could go back to being in an open relationship, not going to work. <laughs> most, a lot more likely to be successful to divorce or stay. You can't ask to go back to a halfway point. It's... If you ask, they might say no, or they might divorce you, which is also fine in this case. But I think, I think one of the things even less likely than a successful independence movement, like total separation, is, is a uh, reduction back to a uh, territory type of thing where we pay half taxes or obey some laws like Puerto Rico. So I, I thought about it. It's a great idea, interesting novel idea. Um, I love that people are creative. And overall, I think there's zero chance, even less chance they would let us, you know, if they let us leave or not let us leave, we're just leaving. But if we ask them to half leave, I think there's no chance they're gonna give us that more freedom, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great answer. And while Patrick comes up, uh, uh, Granite Republic, I guess, uh, I'm pimping, I'll, I'll take a sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> um, Puerto Rico, so the joke I like to make there is, because a lot of, one of the practical questions I get a lot is, but what about the flag? 
And I was like, well, why don't we just let Puerto Rico in? We let New Hampshire go. We don't have to do anything to the flag. That's right. But then it occurred to me that the people of Puerto Rico have voted because they do not want to join. So they're following his his argument, right? So there, there's a lesson there. Well, look, it's conservative economics, right? We all support, uh, at least uh, in our part, a 2% reduction in the number of stars on the flag, uh, a cut in the state budget of 50%, right? So we don't have to get two for every capital. So you can take a good economic perspective, right? <laughs> Budget conscious. Cool. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Like, on the independence has to be unilateral. Yes. It's, otherwise, it's in the abuser's hands, and that's crazy talk. Um, so, as Carla mentioned, I, I started this thing called the Granite Republic. This is the flag I came up with that I'm wearing as a kid today, and I've got all sorts of gear on the GraniteRepublic.com. But the reason why I did this um, was because as I talked to people about secession, I found that most people were still American first. And I think that that's the problem, right? They're, they're not in New Hampshire first. They're not, and I have a hunch that, um, if I were to ask you all, that, that Texas kind of has a, a leg up on this because they just have a history of this uh, kind of talk of Texas being a nation. Um, but, so I started this as an effort to get that talk happening in New Hampshire so people just get this idea like, oh, New Hampshire's better, it's its own nation, and it's better, right? It's better than the rest of the other ones. That's why we need to leave. Um, get this kind of New Hampshire pride going in the sense that it's its own libertarian nation right now, not could be in the future, not, not having to convince someone to make that popular. Um, I'm kind of, I'm from California, and so um, I know I'm doing this here, and other people are working on stuff in secession here in, in Texas, probably you can speak to whether I'm, my hunch is correct that, that you guys kind of have a leg up on this because there's a lot of that culture, but what the heck does California have? I just don't see California having um, a strategy that, for, for liberty or not liberty, a cultural strategy that would get it to a secession movement. It's interesting because just like every state I've ever heard from believes they're a donor state, um, every state I talk to says they have a separate culture and it would be so simple for them to leave. So the Californians I speak with actually are claiming the opposite. Obviously it's not representative either way, but they say, no, we are our own culture. We're so different. We were a state before we can be the biggest country, etc. So I don't have that concern, but I'm going to bring it up with them. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, and I see plenty of California flags. There's a lot of California pride. There is a lot of patriotism as well. Hi, Kevin. Hello. So in order to leave an abuser effectively, you need resources, plans, specifically contingent, contingency plans, and strategy. So what resources, strategies, and plans do we have in mind in order to be effective here? That's such a fascinating question. Um, way long before you were born, I went to social work school, and the first paper I ever wrote was on domestic abuse and leaving. And you, you just made an interesting assumption about what you, you may be correct, but if your choice is between staying and dying and getting out with no resources, I hope most of us would counsel get out mm -hmm. and then deal with it. So for those who believe it's really that bad, especially like Carla said with COVID fascism, etc., I don't know that you're that correct. And I think when people spoke at the hearing about, well, this is not ready yet, we don't have plans for this, we don't have plans for this, if it's bad enough, I don't know that it matters. So I, I hear you, but I don't know. What do you say, Daniel? Well, you know, it's, it's like we have to explain a lot. I mean, part, part of people want to know, okay, they have this view in mind that the day that we have the Texas vote, the next day, there's a lot of fireworks, we're all hung over, and suddenly it's Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, right? You know, we're, we're all rolling around, I've got a mohawk and wearing a leather thong, and I got, you know, I mean, that's, that's just what they, that's what they envision, right? You know I'm waiting for that moment. <laughs> well, look, 50 bucks will get you a long way. Um, but but here, here's the point, and, and this is what we have to explain to people. Exiting is not an act. It, it's, a, it, it's a process, right? It, it, everyone focuses on the vote, but it doesn't happen immediately after the vote, right? The vote in and of itself is an expression of political will that then we have to act upon. Because, you know, let's face it, as states, we haven't been independent in quite some time. There are a lot of processes that we have to put in place. There's some infrastructure that has to be built, but here's the good news, is that it's not insurmountable, right? For two reasons, number one, is effectively all the states are still structured like self-governing independent nations, right? We have our own constitutions, our own governments. The, all, all of those agencies, all of that infrastructure exists. Uh, so it, it's not that far of a jump, but, but here's number two, and, and, and I think it should be encouraging. 
If you pull out a globe and you spin it around and you put your finger on any land mass that's not Antarctica, <laughs> understand that those people are self-governing independent nations that have been able to figure out every single issue that people are concerned about. So we have the expression of political will as expressed in that vote, and then we began to act upon that, and, and it takes whatever time it takes. Unlike Brexit, we're not under a two-year Article 50 clock, right? So it, it takes the time that it takes to get the job done and get it done right. Next question, and I think we have about seven minutes left, so let's try and... Uh... Let's talk about his shirt for seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was surprised you didn't have somebody from the second Vermont Republic here since they're close by, but uh, that does bring up my question. Uh, you're all three representing states that have a coast. What, uh, how is this going to work out for, for landlocked states like, say, Vermont, or if Minnesota wants to leave, or somebody that doesn't have a coast? Uh, trade is the thing I've heard about. <laughs> yeah, in general, it's best if you have a coast with the water. Like we, uh, Texas and California has a big coast, obviously. Mm -hmm. But overall, barring a federal or other state embargo or blockade, and blockade is internationally recognized as an act of war, so barring a blockade, they would still be able to trade. Might not be quite as easy if you had a water port, but they would still be able to trade with every other state in the world. Um, there are lots of landlocked yeah. countries yeah, there are plenty in the of world. Which <laughs> I mean, we could work it out. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of the economy is obviously virtual and done with the internet. Um, as far as getting in the actual food and supplies and stuff, there will be trucks and airplanes like everything else. I don't think it will be Hong a tremendous Kong? issue. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeff, and my question relates to, I think it was some years ago, uh, you heard about me in Barcelona, I believe it was, they had their vote, uh, the referendum, they said, all right, we want to be free, um, I forget the actual margins there, but it did go forward as, yes, we want to be free, and Spain said, no, screw you. <laughs> uh, so what is the specifics in terms of, hey, we have the vote, we want to be free, it's a land, you know, whatever. You spoke to this a little bit, but yeah. next step. Yeah, so uh, just just really quickly on the Catalan issue, right? I mean, and just for some context, uh, the, the, the structure <clears throat> there is far different than what we are. That's why I don't ever refer to what we're doing as secession. It's we're withdrawing our membership in a political and economic union because that's effectively what it is. But the structure there is a little bit different. And, and what you had was a regional government there that wanted to push forth with it, uh, even uh, against the objections of the, the system there in Madrid, right? So that was the source of the conflict. But, you know, where, where we're at structurally here within the United States, the states within the United States, we all absolutely enjoy the right to have this conversation. If you look at Article One, Section 10 of the United States Constitution, it lists everything that states are forbidden from doing. Guess what's not in there? bailing out. It's not there, which means under the 10th Amendment, it's reserved to the states and the people. And then you look to your state constitution. And I know you guys have a strong provision in your state constitution. Yeah, I, I wish I could quote it like I could quote Article 1, Section mm -hmm. 2 of ours, which says that all political power is inherent in the people. And it gives us an inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish our government in such manner as we think expedient. So this is not a mother may I proposition. Right. The people have a legal vote on the issue, which is one of the reasons that the, the constitutional amendment there and the legislation on our side are super important, but it goes to a debate and a full vote of the people. And then once the people express their political will, it is the mandate upon our government to do something about it. We never ask for permission. The next time we will see those federal bastards is across a negotiating table. <laughs> We can get them all in. Uh, otherwise, we'll see how we are. On Lightning time. round. <laughs> this is a very New Hampshire specific one, and I kind of sort of apologize for that. Um, what is the um, future stance, like kind of looking ahead? Uh, so the bill's been there. There's going to be the roll call vote. Um, everyone in the in this room, you know, raise your hands. Hey, you know, do we have self determination rights? The answer is of course. I think most people would say. But um, how much? like baby with the bathwater sort of thing is there? Like how much retribution should be and will be uh, leveled against these representatives who, like you said, um, I was really shocked because I, I, you know, teleconferenced into the, to the thing and the guy said, um, I forget his name, but the otherwise good representative, he said, yeah, there's a lot of good things in here, but I'm gonna vote against it because blah, blah. I'm like, dude, like, do we primary that guy? Like how much, how much is the free state movement willing to become a single voter block where like, yeah. hey, 
we don't care that, that, that we're taking our lead from 110 Liberty representatives and we're gonna primary 90 of them because they're otherwise good. Yep. But you failed question. on this critical issue. So session. just to state, yeah. the Free State Project takes no political positions. We are yeah. a five hundred one c three educational <laughs> nonprofit. I, I apologize Did you for the semantic ambiguity. I progress, but uh, they're entitled to opinions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, sorry, sorry about that. I didn't mean to imply that. Again, my personal opinion. I don't speak for the FHI, five hundred one c three, and all that as well. FSP. It's a great question. I actually said I, I felt bad. I, I think I apologized. If I hadn't, I will yet. I was talking to a state rep, and I said I was upset one day about the Independence Day a few weeks ago. I texted him, and I said I'm gonna primary everyone who doesn't vote for this and and he got offended it was a nasty thing to say um and, and again i i didn't mean it I was, I was upset and because we can't like you said we have around 100 libertarian reps right. if 99 or 90 or 95 of them don't vote for this i don't want to get rid of them they i don't are think it should be that kind of issue for sure in yeah. the sense that we're a community so if we can't even persuade our own people yet mm -hmm. that means we have a lot of work to do there's groundwork to do here i mean it's you know it's a, it's every time it's just another conversation I, all right I, three more minutes I, I, hang on but i here's maybe the one point of divergence that we have right uh, uh, of the panel up here is the what we told our legislators with the texas independence referendum act it was that very thing everyone who did not sign on to it would not get our support and we would find a primary opponent for them and the reason is quite simple if they will not support our fundamental right of self-government how can we trust them to support anything else that we believe in right if it is an inalienable right we have to look at it just like if they voted against gun rights or our, our, our right to free speech or our right to worship according to the dictates of our conscience, until we begin to view the right of self-government as an inalienable right like the rest of them, they will continue down this path of, uh, of, of further integrating us into the federal system. So maybe the one point of divergence here, but they shouldn't feel threatened. If they took an oath to support our rights and they are truly there to protect our rights, self-government is just as important as the right to keep and bear arms or any of the other ones. Right. That, that is actually a really good point, and I think that is something that those of us who do messaging want to maybe think about that framing going forward, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's like, well, we're, we're not debating this. The right exists, and uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Max, real quick. Yeah, One yeah. More. So um, what do you guys see as the likely response from the federal government if one of these votes take place? I mean, you know, obviously they're going to try to prevent it. <laughs> But what uh, you know? What taxes do you expect them to use, and what are your thoughts on countering that? We, we already know, and I've said this many times. The courts will 100% say it's unconstitutional, and then we will say we don't care what you say. We just voted to leave. We're leaving. You know, the abused wife packs up her bags and leaves, and the husband says you can't leave. Okay, um, I don't care what you say. I'm leaving because you abused me. So yeah, we, we know the courts are going to say it's unconstitutional, and that's why I love being a voluntarist. If I were a constitutionalist like I was a few years ago, I would have to you know respect that. And because I say I obey the courts, if they said it's unconstitutional, I would have to admit, you know, or be a hypocrite and say, well, they said I can't leave, so I can't leave. But I've said many times, I don't care about the courts. The courts can say I have rights, or I don't, I don't care what they say. They're a bunch of, you know, old status dunces and black robes, and they don't run my life, I run my life. So it doesn't really matter, but yeah, that's a great point. What else would the federal government do as far as retaliation? Well, look, uh, th there's really, you have to understand that for the last 75 years, the federal system has put itself in a position where it actually limits their options if a state were to leave, right? This is not the 1860s anymore, right? right? The world kept spinning. And, and the last 75 years of federal foreign policy has sent our grandfathers, grandmothers, our fathers and mothers, some of us in this room, and our sons and daughters off to fight, bleed, and die for the right of self-determination for other people. Mm -hmm. The United States has signed treaties that protect the right of self-determination, that they actually encourage it. Uh, they, right now, as it stands, they are sanctioning Russia, who has invaded the Ukraine, and denying them the right of self-determination. The aforementioned President Peepads wanted to <laughs> sanction Myanmar for overturning a democratically elected, uh, a, a democratic election that they had, right? So, so they've painted themselves into a corner, which is all the more reason that it's important for us to follow process, to have the public debate, to have a legally constituted vote, because then we take a lot of options off the table. And frankly, and I know the, the thing nagging in the back of your mind is probably the thought of military action. And, and I'm going to tell you this, recent surveys have shown that over half of the United States military active duty combat troops believe that states have an absolute constitutional right to withdraw from, from the Union. So if they want to make, pull that trigger, they have to understand that half of the military will not obey that unconstitutional order, and in addition, the very threat 
of using military force against any state that's leaving will cause other states to leave and they won't even bother with a vote. It will bring international condemnation, sanctions, and potentially military action against the federal government. They know this, we know this, so they fight hard to keep us from having the vote because that's the only place they can stop it. Wow, and on that note, uh, we have sadly run out of time. I do want to remind everyone, first of all, thank you to our wonderful panelists, but also if you have not gotten your free state of New Hampshire passport yet, you can pick one up at the front desk where you can also get a free mug for a $20 donation. <laughs> Inside, uh, please, if anyone ever takes this to the airport, don't be mad at me. Uh, it, it looks a little too good. They might but shoot you. But on the inside, there's a lot of fun things that you can do as a, as a tourist to New Hampshire or possibly a new mover. It's supposed to be a little fun tool to help you assimilate into the Borg. So, <laughs> nice. on, that, uh, on that note, thank you guys so much. Uh, thanks for coming. Very good.